Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, I hope all of our listeners out there in Zoom land find my talk interesting. Um, I'm going to speak for somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes, and then I'm very happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, as Bart mentioned, I did my PhD dissertation looking specifically at the transnational networks of Baghdadi Jews in the 19th and 20th century. But instead of giving you something very technical tonight or really very academic, I'm going to present what I think are kind of the highlights and interesting parts of Iraqi Jewish history in the 19th and 20th century that maybe you're less aware of. So if there are things I don't mention and you want my opinion on, I'm more than happy to answer them. But this is really a presentation about what I think about when I think about Jews from Iraq and how I think about the changes that happened in the last, oh, I don't know, 170 years, shall we say. Uh, so maybe just a little bit on Iraqi Jews. Um, you know, Iraqi Jews go by lots of different names, right? So sometimes people will call themselves Iraqi, but we'll also see this idea of Baghdadi. So that's really from a specific city. Um, but you'll also see the term Babylonian. Um, and I think Babylonian is maybe one of the most interesting because one, it relates to really the ancient origins of Jews in Iraq, right? I mean, we can talk about the first exile. Um, and then we can also talk about the Babylonian Talmud. And I think that's kind of the first thing which is important to think about when we think about Iraqi Jews, right? Because Iraqi Jews represent the, um, really the first diaspora community. And if we study Jewish history, we're always talking about diaspora and how the Jewish diaspora comes about. And when we talk about diaspora, that it's a positive term um, and it's one that's debated today, especially in academia. But Iraq or Babylon is really the first place where we see a functioning Jewish community outside of the land of Israel. And although we don't know so much about Jews in Iraq prior to the 19th century, um, we have sources. We have sources from the Talmud, of course. We have sources from 12th century travelers. Um, we can guess that there's more or less a Jewish community in Iraq um, for at least the past 2,500 years, shall we say. Um, and one of the sources, for example, is Benjamin of Tudela, who makes a very famous trip throughout the Levant and going to India. And in the 12th century, he says that there are about 40,000 Jews in Iraq or um, Mesopotamia, another term, 28 synagogues and 10 yeshivot. But most scholars today think that uh, Tudel is a liar, <laughs> that he completely overestimates the size. Maybe there are 10,000 Jews, maybe 28 synagogues. I mean, you only need 10 men, right? Um, but that, why is this important? Why is this interesting? Well, I think it's interesting because even in the modern period, people know about the Jewish community of Iraq. Um, and they know about it because of the Talmud, and they know about it because there are important shrines as well. For example, the tomb of Ezekiel, which is a traditional pilgrimage site. And this is also important to take into consideration when we think about how Jews in Iraq were viewed by other Iraqis, people from other religious communities, Muslims and Christians, and these, these, were, these groups were also broken down into smaller communities as well, right? So you have in Iraq in, let's say the 19th century, you don't just have Muslims, right? You have Sunni, you have Shiites, you have Muslims who speak Syriac, you have Muslims who speak um, even Farsi in some cases because they have origins in what is today Iran. Um, and you, in, same thing in the Christian community, you have Chaldeans in Baghdad, you have uh, the Syriac community in the north. And of all of these communities, some groups are seen as foreigners, right? Particularly those who come from Iran or those who come from the north. But even in Iraq, the Jewish community is always seen as being indigenous. And indigenous is a word that historians don't like to use. But I think in this case, it's okay. It means that they were local and they weren't seen as foreigners. Um, they were really seen as part of the history of, um, of Iraq. Uh, 
So that's kind of where I approach the history of Jews in Iraq from. Now, in reality, we know that Jews in Iraq, um, Jews did experience migration, right? Not everybody's family had been there since um, the composition of the Talmud. Um, and that actually there's some good evidence that some Sephardic Jews even made their way to Iraq. But unlike in other areas, like in Amsterdam, for example, where you always had two communities, so the Sephardi and the Ashkenazi, in Iraq, the foreigners, again, were always integrated into the community. And after a generation or two, you would become a Baghdadi yourself. You would become a true Iraqi Jew. And another, so then another point in this is that a lot of times people think about, well, we have two main groups of Jews, Sephardi Jews and Ashkenazi Jews. And today in Israel, you talk about Mizrahi. So there are issues with that term. If you're interested about the issues with it, we can discuss that at the end of my talk. But if we look at the term um, Sephardi, these aren't Sephardi Jews. They don't come from Spain. Later, some of them invent a, an identity from Spain, but there's no historical, there's no um, historical suggestion that Baghdadis ever went to Spain. And so this really represents a unique group, right? It represents a unique group in terms of their approach to halakha, um, their minhagim linguistically. So what happens? What does modernity mean for this community? And I think also what does modernity mean in Judaism? And I want to kind of present you just a couple of ideas about what I think of when I think about how Jewish communities change, maybe beginning in the late 18th century in Europe and certainly in the 19th century in the Islamic world. But we can think about modernity as a transformation of traditional societies towards new societal norms and the challenges of traditional conventions. Um, what does this mean in normal speak? It means choice, right? It means that you can send your children to a religious school or you can send your children to a school which teaches secular subjects whole. It means that women have more freedom outside the home. It means that you can decide to be less observant. It means that maybe you have more choice in your profession. So modernity is, doesn't mean the same thing to everybody, but it's this idea of change that is connected very much to choice. Now, modernity is a fluid term and lots of people like to discuss what it is, but when we're talking about it in terms of the community in Iraq, and sometimes when I look at other things, I like to break up this idea of modernity into two ideas. So one is structural modernity. And what do I mean by that? It relates to the modernization of the state. So such as a centralization of government institutions, secularization of government institutions, rule of law, and the development of a public infrastructure. So having a public tram, right? That can be structural modernity, but structural modernity can also mean that um, charity is no longer something that's informal, or something that's controlled by the rabbis, but instead it's something that is organized by a non-religious group or a group that identifies itself with a religious community, but is separate from the religious hierarchy. So a secular hierarchy, like we have today, right? In most synagogues, you'll have the rabbi and then you'll have the board and the board will actually make the business decisions, right? And these are, these are new structures, we have them in the pre-modern period, but, but this very structured way of running a Jewish community certainly evolves in the 19th century, and especially in Baghdad. And then we can talk about intellectual modernity. And this really refers to the reception of, in a first phase, European enlightenment ideals. So that's interested in hard sciences, philosophy of knowledge, and new forms of literature. But I wouldn't want you to think that all modernity comes from um, from Europe. I think that's a very limited way of looking at this. And in the Arab world, sometimes we'll talk about the Nachta. So that's a literary renaissance, kind of equivalent to the Haskalah. And Iraqi Jews will participate actually both in the Haskalah and in the Nachta. So when we talk about intellectual modernity, it's just this idea of being open to new ideas. And what gets the ball rolling are some ideas from Europe, but then certainly people throughout Iraq and throughout the Arab world, regardless of their religion, engage with these ideas and Iraqi Jews are, are no different. Um, so if we talk about the beginning of an Iraqi Jewish Renaissance, 
we can talk about this from the perspective of changes in the 19th century. And to give you an idea of population, um, in 1828, so that's when we kind of begin to have a little bit of reliable demographic information and still take it with a grain of salt, you only have about 6,000 Jews around Baghdad. It's very small, but the overall population is also small, and this is due to plague, poverty, um, and all of the general ills which afflict, frankly, the world um, in this period. But by 1900, the population is over 60,000. And in this period, we see a transformation in the Jewish leadership in the city, which I'll talk about. And this is part of the development of a communal infrastructure of better communal welfare. And what comes from this, and this is also related, of course, to um, ties with Europe and also local changes. Um, you have a community which is can be considered impoverished in the 1830s. And by 1910, you have the, um, the assistant to the British consul who estimates that about 60% of the Jews in Baghdad can be considered middle class, which is a huge, I mean, which, which is really an enormous number. Um, and that's another, I believe it's 5% can be considered upper class. So to have a society where only about 30, 35% of people can be considered lower class or impoverished in this period is really striking. And we'll look at some of the reasons for this. Um, but also, and this is part of this story of Iraqi Jews, is that in the beginning of the 19th century, there's limited contact with other Jewish communities towards structure, um, with other Jewish communities. But as we'll see throughout the century, you'll have more and more structural partnerships with European Jewish organizations. And this will change also how Baghdadi Jews see themselves in terms of the whole Jewish world, right? And I think this is always an interesting question, which I like to ask people is, how do you think of yourself as a Jew? Do you identify as Fardi? Do you identify as a Jew in the diaspora? Do you identify as an idea of Kol uh, Israel Haverim, right? And in, from, as a historian, I kind of try to put myself in the shoes of Baghdadis in the late 19th century or in, um, in the 1920s, and how did they see the world, right? How did they identify with Jews around the world? Did they identify with Jews around the world? Um, so what happens in the 19th century? Well, the Jews in Baghdad definitely partner with the Ottoman authorities because Iraq is an Ottoman province. Well, it's actually three Ottoman provinces in this period, and the provinces are Mosul in the north, Baghdad in the middle, and Basra in the south. And you have Jews in all three areas, but particularly in Baghdad, which is the center of the Jewish community in terms of population, but also the seat of power. Jews work with the Ottomans to modernize, and they open one of the first, well, actually the first school to teach secular subjects in 1864. And the school is opened in partnership between the Jewish community, individuals, not a formal board, and the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which is a French organization that developed schools across the Middle East and North Africa and a little bit in Europe to elevate Jews, to give them the tools to get themselves out of poverty, and but also to make them relevant within the new world. And in the new world, that actually relates to colonization, of course, so French and English. So it means teaching European languages. But Midat Pasha, the Ottoman governor, thought having a modern school was a great idea. And so in this first Jewish school, you actually had many Christian and Muslim children of local elites who attended these schools until a couple decades later, other schools were opened. But the schools remain um, some of the best schools in Baghdad. And so even up until at least the 1920s, you have Muslim and Christian children who, who attend these schools. Um, furthermore, you have something called the Tanzimat reforms. So these are Ottoman reforms that changed the city. Um, they also change the Jewish communal structure and they give more power to lay elites. So what, who are lay elites? That's not the rabbinate, but those are usually the leaders of the community. They're usually wealthy. They usually have had some type of secular education. And we see a board emerging. We see the Jewish community beginning to say, we have a problem with poverty. We have a problem with lack of vocational training for our youth. 
And so instead of doing this in an informal manner, uh, they begin to attack these social issues in an organized form by pooling their money, um, by on behalf of the community hiring teachers. And they do this in collaboration with these foreign Jewish organizations, uh, but they also do this as a communal collaboration. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens over the course of a century, right? Um, so it's slow, but it, it, it will make a difference. And if we look at why the Jews really become one of the most vibrant middle classes in post-World War I Iraq, it's because of this development of a communal infrastructure. And part of it has to do with wealth. And that ties into migration. So in the late, not the late, in the early 19th century, you have Jews from Iraq who begin to go to India and then East Asia, and some of them become very, very wealthy. You've probably heard of the Sassoon family or the Kuduri family, and they don't sever their ties with Iraq and they remit funds to Iraq. So you have also, and other families as well, you have a large influx of cash coming into these communities, which allow them to build these schools and maintain these charities on a much larger level than anything that was known before. Uh, and what's interesting, again, when we talk about modernity and choice, is the Alliance Israelite Universelle in partnership with the Jewish community and funded by Eli Kaduri, who is in uh, Shanghai at this point. They open a girls' school in 1889, and that's the first girls' school in Iraq as well. So I think this really ties into all these ideas of modernity in that now girls have a choice for education. And the school is this interesting partnership of an organization in France, the local community, and a wealthy Baghdadi in East Asia. Um, so just thinking about kind of the lay council, and this is this council that will manage the Jewish community. And the Jewish community in 1950, right before the mass migration, um, is about 130,000 and it grows every, every year, more or less, in the period between 1900 and 1950. Um, but they're really, it's really fusing these ideas of both structural and intellectual modernity, because you can have one and not the other. But these new structures incorporate the schools, the societies, the charities under one communal umbrella. And they begin to engage in formal relationships with Jewish communities around the world, these organizations. And they also continue to work with the government. Now, they did this prior to this whole change um, and look forward both to the West and to the East, but they up it. And they, they really try to leverage all of their connections for the benefit of the community. Um, when we look at these organizations and this infrastructure, and I think what's really important, and I'll come back to this at the end of my talk, is that these institutions are not closed. I already mentioned this, right? The schools are open to non-Jewish children, now children of elites, and the hospitals that are founded in the late 19th and early 20th century are not limited to Jews either. So this is also the beginning of the Jews in Iraq saying, yes, we're a tight community, we're an organized community, um, they'll eventually begin to think of themselves as a religious minority. But what we do is not just for the benefit of our community, but it's for the benefit of all of Iraqi society, right? And that our, um, our wealth and our success is a benefit to all of Iraq, right? So it's a very civil-minded way of looking at how you organize your community. Um, I think I, well, I kind of talked about this and I'm not, I'm not sure how much is, you're interested in 19th century politics of Jews in Iraq, but I think one thing to think about, because I don't think people always think about this when they think about Jews in the Islamic world, is that already in the 19th century, you have Jews participating in politics. And I'm not talking about Jewish politics now, I'm talking about Ottoman politics. Um, so you have one very famous Jew who becomes a member of the Ottoman parliament. And if you can see the pictures, it's the picture below, Heskel Sesson. No, sorry. Is his last name Sesson? I'll have to check. It's, um, his first name is Heskel. I'm sure somebody will tell me who it is afterwards. Otherwise, I'll check my notes. Uh, but what's interesting about him is he'll be a member of the Ottoman parliament. 
and then he will become the first minister of finance for the Iraqi state. So this is really an example of how, and, and he is somebody who is educated in the local secular schools run by the Jewish community. He'll travel to Vienna to become a lawyer, leveraging his networks as Jews. There's amazing work on him by a woman named Annie Green in the US, but he really kind of represents this modern Jewish man, both at the end of the Ottoman period, but also with the birth of the Iraqi state. Um, for intellectual modernity, well, what pushes this, right? What pushes Jews in Iraq to become open, not just to changes within the Islamic world or the Arabic speaking world, but the wider world? Um, and one of them is foreign Jews in Baghdad, because when they open these schools, they bring teachers in. And initially they bring teachers in from um, Europe, from France, from England. And then later they'll bring teachers in also from all parts of the Middle East and North Africa. So just this mixture of different types of Jews changes how they begin to think about Jews and how they begin to think about their place in the world as Jews. Um, and it, so it's less sometimes linked to religion. And now sometimes it also becomes linked to customs or tradition. I don't know if we can say culture, because I don't know if we can talk about a pan-Jewish culture, but you're beginning to look at this idea of maybe a secular Jewish identity. Furthermore, you have the satellite communities that begin to flourish in India and the Far East. So places like Bombay and Calcutta in India, but also Singapore, Shanghai, to a lesser extent, Hong Kong. And these Jews keep their connections with Baghdad. So now these Jews see themselves as being linked um, to their cousins and to their family members oceans away or continents away, who begin to see themselves as being British in most cases, because we're in a context of British colonialism, but who still see themselves as being Baghdadi. Um, and through all of this, they have access to foreign periodicals. So they can read the Bulletin de l'Alliance Israelite Universelle, the French newspaper of the Alliance, or they can read the Jewish Chronicle out of London, or they can read the Jewish journals and newspapers, which are being published by Baghdadis in India and in um, East Asia. So all of this is pushing them to then think about, oh, other Jewish communities and what's interesting. But you'll see that we, well, we know from the subscriptions that they begin to read articles about other Jewish communities and see what questions they're debating. So this might be questions about roles women can play in society or questions about cash roots in a modern world with prepared food. And we don't know which of these debates um, became prevalent in Baghdad. I'm sure that's something maybe for another scholar to follow up on, but at least we know that they really know what's going on. And even later, you know, in the as early as 1933, they're concerned about the fate of, for example, German Jewry. So for all of these reasons, it's why I say that we can really begin to think about this opening of a secular Jewish culture. And this also comes through these schools, which teach Hebrew, um, but they focus on secular subjects and they teach Jewish history. So they don't teach um, Jewish law per se. Students can study these things at the yeshiva or in classes after school, but they focus on the idea of we're Jews and we have our own history and it's important to know this history. And you have a whole social milieu which develops around these schools. You have societies for the alumni, you have charities to help students whose parents can't afford the um, whose parents can't afford the school fees. Some of the schools are free, some of them charge fees. And you have libraries, and these are multilingual libraries that have French books and English books and Arabic books and Hebrew books. And so we can really talk about an intellectually open society. Um, and that's, that's really where this modernity comes from. And I think that's really why we can talk about Iraqi Jewry flourishing uh, in the late 19th century, which is mostly limited to an elite, but certainly in the 20th century where it becomes much more widespread with the extension of the middle class and the growth of the middle class. So what does this mean? Where are we then in, let's say 1920, so after World War II? 
um, uh, sorry, after World War I with Iraqi Jews. Um, and a lot of times in academic circles, we'll talk about the Iraqi orientation because nowhere else in the, in the Arab world, certainly, did the Jewish community adapt such a high level of patriotism and commitment to the state. And we can ask why this is. And I, I think there are a couple of reasons. I think it's pretty well understood, but certainly getting back to this idea is they're not seen as immigrants, right? They're seen as a historic community with their place in Iraq and their rights and responsibilities as citizens is enshrined in the 1924 constitution. So in this case, they are part of the new Iraqi state as full citizens, but the communal infrastructure is respected, which means a little bit like in Israel today, in the sense that if you're going to get married, you do it through the rabbinate. If you get divorced, you do it through the rabbinate. Other issues of taxation or inheritance, they follow Jewish law, but Jews still have, at least on paper, this might change later on, have the rights as citizens. And Iraqis of all social classes embrace this, but particularly the elites and the upper middle class become involved in all levels of society. So what do I mean by that? Well, they're active in the community, right? They're active in these schools, these school boards, charity boards, social events, but they're also active in the national level as members of local governments. Um, I believe the Iraqi parliament has five seats which are guaranteed to Jews. Um, in the, in the civil service holding important roles because of course they've benefited from having the secular education where they speak foreign languages, which makes them very important in this new nation. Um, and then they're also involved on the transnational level with these Jewish organizations that are based in Europe. So they're active in all parts of society and with the role of the British in Iraq and the Iraqi economy growing, they continue to see a lot of socioeconomic mobility in the 1920s and 1930s. And what happens is, when, what, what happens when people get money in the first half of the 20th century? They move out of the old city centers and they buy big houses um, in the suburbs. And it's amazing when you look at pictures, it's too bad, I should have tried to find a picture for this PowerPoint, you'll see that you know, these middle class Jews would buy homes on the city, on the outskirts of the city, and they would share communities with the Muslim and Christian members of the middle class. And these open societies were really integrated this idea of a general Iraqi culture. And Iraqi Jews were part of this. They were seen as full citizens. People knew who was Jewish, people, you know, knew who was Christian as well. Let's say the Christians ate pork and the Jews fasted on Yom Kippur, but there was really this idea that we have one Iraqi culture and regardless of faith, we all contribute to this Iraqi culture. And the idea that Jews were also important in these transnational Jewish networks was not seen as a problem. It was seen as understandable because it benefited the community. And on a further note, if we look at how did they react to Zionism, um, here I use the word apathetic but we could also use the word ambivalent. So what does that mean? It means that this was an open society and you know some Jews were communists in Iraq and some Jews were more interested in slightly more right-wing um, parties but most Jews were probably centrist politically and they were interested in, in Zionism in the sense of some people were interested in Hebrew and the resurrection of this Hebrew language. They were interested in the new settlements in Mandate Palestine, right, Kibbutzim, but they actually thought that the idea of a Jewish state was kind of crazy. And so they weren't as invested in it as Eastern European Jews were, for example. And you have some exceptions to this, and I say that because usually at the end of my talk, someone will say, but my great grandfather was a big Zionist. Yes, there are exceptions. But overall, why were they not as excited or as invested in Zionism as other communities? because life was good, right? They weren't experiencing the same type of political and economic instability and precarity as Jewish communities elsewhere. And so they felt like they were 100% part of the Iraqi state. So although though they were interested in this project, they weren't invested in it emotionally. And I think another thing to take into consideration is Iraq is very close, right, to Israel. 
And during the mandate period, Iraqi Jews would go on holiday to Tel Aviv and they would go to the beach and it was fun. But one, they were aware of the political issues, right? They knew that there were other people there besides Jews. It wasn't like in Eastern Europe where people would hear a land for, um, a land without a people for a people without a land. They knew there was a population. And they also knew that the economy in Mandate Palestine was much worse than in Iraq in this period. So there was no reason to be invested because people still saw their future in Iraq. And why wouldn't they? Because they saw themselves as being this historic indigenous community. Um, so because this is really what I study, I thought I'd talk a little bit more about what we mean by these transnational Jewish networks and their importance, both for Iraqi Jews, but Iraqi society as a whole. And if we talk about the satellite communities, so these are these Iraqis who live in India and who live in, in East Asia. In the beginning, especially, they act as a bridge between Europe and Iraq, which is kind of funny because actually we're going east then to go west, but they show Iraq, Jews in Iraq, Baghdadis in Iraq, that you can become more modern. You can, for example, take your wife on a honeymoon or have a philosophy salon, and you can still remain a Torah observant Jew. And so these Jews in the satellite communities politically begin to identify with Britain, but they still maintain a Baghdadi identity. And that kind of paves the way for this idea that you can have an Iraqi identity as a citizen, but you can also maintain your traditions. Uh, furthermore, involvement with these Jewish philanthropic organizations, so again, the Alliance and the Anglo-Jewish Association, they provide expertise. So what do I mean by expertise? Well, they're able to get specialists to do audits of the school system. They're able to get doctors and nurses to come in and train the local community on public health. And they're also able to get financial aid, although most money will come from the community or from the Baghdadis and the satellite communities. And they use this for the benefit of the community. But once again, they use this for the benefit of all of Iraqi society. Um, furthermore, the rabbis in Iraq during this period, they're engaged with rabbis in Mandate Palestine. They're actually engaged with rabbis in London and New York, and they develop their own network. So we can talk about a very connected and very cosmopolitan Iraqi Jewish community in the 1920s and the 1930s, which I think is sometimes forgotten um, or, or simply just not thought about when we thought, think about what's going on in the Jewish world in this period. And as I mentioned before, they participate again in this multilingual global media space. So they could read Jewish newspapers and because they've been educated in schools where they learn English, French, Arabic, Hebrew, they can read a Zionist newspaper from Mandate Palestine. They can read an Arab newspaper from Beirut or from Cairo. They can read the French newspapers. We know they get Jewish newspapers from New York, from London in English. And why do we know this? Because sometimes they decide to write editorials or to send reports about their community. And we also know that these newspapers are in the libraries of the school. So people are reading them, right? So they're very, very engaged both in Iraq as Arabs who speak Arabic, but also as Jews in this new Jewish world, which is becoming more secular and less based on rabbinic religious structures. They still exist, of course, they're very important, but is now also looking at secular structures which are relate often to education or culture and or public health, shall we say. Um, so just a couple of conclusions, and then I guess we'll open it up to questions if there are any questions. But in this period that I'm talking about, we see actually a symbiosis between national and transnational. And what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of times in history, right, Jews are accused of having dual loyalties, right? How can you be a Dutch citizen if you also love Israel and have family there, right? I mean, these are things we still hear today. Um, but in Iraq, in the 20s and 30s, uh, this is seen as being beneficial. And this is seen as being okay and almost normal because people think about themselves in relation to communal organizations. If you ask uh, any Iraqi in the 20s, what are you? 
a couple of intellectuals might see Iraqi, but most would say, I'm a Chaldean Christian, or I'm a Jew, or I'm a Sunni Muslim, right? So this is seen as normal, and that the Jewish community has such strong foreign ties and is building all of these important institutions, this is actually giving the community prestige because it's aiding the larger nation. So you have this really interesting symbiosis or convivencia, right? Kind of like a second golden age after Spain, um, which, which I think is fascinating. You have these multiple networks and they're not mutually exclusive. So you can identify as an Arab, and a Jew and an Iraqi, and no one's going to doubt you for this, and no one's going to think that's strange. It's seen as normal. Um, and on a final note, I mean, a lot of this, when we talk about money and infrastructure building, it comes, of course, from the wealthy Jews or those with geographic mobility, but because so much of this is based on charity and education, it really goes to all demographics. And even the poorest Iraqi Jews benefit from this. And they understand because their children receive clothing from these charities or free school lunches or vocational training, that they're part of a larger Jewish world. Um, and this larger Jewish world in this period certainly replaces certain parts of the state when we talk about welfare. And so even in this modernization, even as the community evolves, this Jewish welfare is really an important part of the, of the Iraqi Jewish society in this period. So that's my talk, maybe slightly shorter than we said, maybe there's more time for questions. Um, now, I realize I haven't talked about the end of the community because I think that's something people know more about and we can talk about anti-Jewish sentiment and issues with Palestine, if you want, or the Farhud. But I talked about this because this actually is a period that lasts for much longer than the decline of Iraqi Jewry in the 1940s. And I think it's much more indicative of Iraqi Jewish culture in this period. Uh, so I hope you found it interesting and feel free to ask any questions you may have. Thank you very much.